houses that are kind of set into a mountainside <laughs> or, or those houses that are built on like on a unique rock formation or something like that? You ever seen those? I, <laughs> man, one wrong step out the front door. <laughs> Beautiful view, right? Beautiful view, but risky. You, I kind of wonder if the guy who um, is living in that house is aware of how erosion works. <laughs> you know, it, it's going to take some time, but uh, you know where that house is going to end up? Right in the water. Right in the water. Maybe he, maybe he missed that day in science class. But water has this way of, of chiseling away at dirt and chiseling away at stone even to go where it wants to go. You know, water has that power. So, so you, you really have to wonder if uh, and hope that that house floats because <laughs> we'll find out one of these days. <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in the fact that um, in the Bible, water is sometimes used as a symbol for the trials, the struggles that we face in life. Have you ever noticed that, how water is sometimes used to, to symbolize the difficult times that we face in life? Have you noticed that before? In, um, if, in Matthew chapter 7, you don't have to look this up, I'll, just, I'll recap it for you, but in Matthew 7, Jesus says that when we follow him, it's like building our house on rock. Now, I don't think he's talking about that. <laughs> He's, in that story, he's comparing rock to sand. And he's saying that when you build your house on, on rock, on a firm foundation on him, it can withstand it when the waves and the rain come and pound against your house. You know, you get what he's saying? Because if your house is built on, on sand, it's not built on a firm foundation, and the waters start pounding against you, what happens to the house? What happens? It crashes. It crashes down. And so what he's saying the same thing about us, right? He's saying that, that when you've got your house, your faith, built on a firm foundation, the storms in life, the water, the wind, the rain's going to pound against you. But if you are built on a firm foundation, you will stand strong. If you're not built on a firm foundation, what happens to our lives? They collapse. But it's interesting that he uses water as a symbol for the life that tests us, the struggles that test us, you know? He does the same thing in, in, in Matthew 14. The disciples are out on a boat, and it's the middle of a storm. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes walking by, like on the water, walking on the water. And the disciples are freaking out, you know? Oh, it's a ghost. And Jesus calls Peter to come out to him. And he does. He does. Peter is out walking on the water until... He notices the waves crashing, the water crashing around him, and then all of a sudden he starts to sink. And Jesus catches him, of course, because Jesus is a nice guy. He catches him. But when you think about what that story means for us, it's interesting to note that Peter was doing great. He was walking on the water as long as he was looking at Jesus. But as soon as he stopped looking at Jesus and started looking at the waves and the, and the water crashing around him, he started going down. And Jesus is saying the same thing, right? That when the waves crash against us, the water crashes against our lives, the storms hit us, if we're looking at him, we can walk on the water, on the storms. But as soon as you start noticing the storms that are crashing around, you start, as soon as you take your eyes off of him, what happens to us? We start to sink. Isn't that interesting? In both these stories, Jesus uses water to symbolize the, the, the storms that we face, the struggles that we face in life. And in both stories, he's saying that if your foundation isn't firm, if your faith isn't firm, the storms in life are going to do what to your faith? They're going to erode it? knock it over, wear it down. You know, so the question that, that, that I want us to wrestle with a little bit today, the question is, does your faith form your life? Or do events in your life form your faith? All right, let that question just kind of sink in a little bit. Does your faith form and guide the way you live your life? Or does your life, things that happen in your life, is it forming your faith? 
Do you get the question? Is your faith strong enough to withstand the storms that are raging around in life? Is your faith strong enough to stand up against that? Or are those storms chiseling away at your faith and eroding it and shaping it into something else? Now, the, the, probably we would mostly answer, well, a little bit of both. Probably a little bit of both. But what is, what's the right answer? The first one, right? The right answer is the first one. Our faith should be forming the way we live our lives, right? Our faith in God's love, our trust in Jesus Christ ought to, be, ought to be shaping and affecting every little part of our lives. It should be guiding our daily relationships. It should be guiding our attitudes about work and school. It should be guiding the way we handle our finances, the, what, what, we, what we choose for entertainment. Our faith should be leading the way we live our lives, and, and of course, the clear problem in our world, maybe in some of our lives, is that it just isn't that way. It's just not that way. You know, we, we proclaim our love for God, we, we proclaim a love for Jesus, but there's something that keeps us from allowing him to reach those deep parts of our lives where we need his love to transform us the most. Last week, we talked about, we talked about the, the word of God. We talked about the Bible and uh, the place that the Bible has in our lives. And we talked about the need to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word, right? It's one thing to listen to this and to read this and to hold it. It's another thing to act on it, to put it into practice. And so the, the, the question is, how do you begin to do that? How do you begin to be a doer of the word? And I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you right now. Ask the question, so what? So what? When, when, you're, when you're reading the Bible or, or when you hear a story that Jesus told or when we're talking about the basics of our Christian faith, ask yourself, so what? What, is this, what does this truly, honestly mean for the way that I live my life? What is this going to do to the way I live my life? So what? What? And I think that that's probably the biggest barrier for people between hearing the word and doing the word. You know, we don't ask that question. We don't, we don't translate our beliefs into actions. You know what I'm saying? Our, we have our beliefs. We have these things that we believe and they sit neatly on a shelf in our mind. But we don't use those beliefs to form our faith. We don't use those beliefs to form our daily lives. The storms around us may be forming our faith. The winds and the rains that are hammering us, they may be forming our faith. But our beliefs often don't form our faith because, because we're not asking the so what question. What does it matter that I believe this or this? How does that translate into my daily life? You know, I mean, think about this. Really think about this. Do your beliefs affect your behavior? Do your beliefs affect the way you live your life? Do your beliefs affect the way you treat other people? Do your, do your beliefs affect the way you live? Or is it the other way around? Does life affect what you believe? Isn't that interesting to think about this? You, know, you want to see an example of this in the Bible? There's an example of, of what I'm talking about. It's in Matthew chapter 18. Take, if you've got your, get out your pew Bible, or if you've got your own, Matthew 18. But in the blue pew Bible in front of you, it's on page uh, 816, 816. If you've got a large print Bible, it's uh, 1510. So either 816, if you've got the blue, the blue Bible here, or 1510 in, uh, in your large print Bible. And it's Matthew 18 that we're looking at. This is interesting because we're, we're, we're talking about whether or not we allow our beliefs to shape who we are. All right? Do we allow our faith to affect the way that we live our lives? All right? Do our beliefs shape us or does life shape our beliefs? Okay? So, so let's take a look at that. If you've got your Bible open up, we're going to look at um, down at verse 21. Down at verse 21. And, uh, and this is interesting. Cindy alluded to this a little bit in the children's sermon. Peter came to, to him, Jesus, and he asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? I mean, seven sounds like quite a bit, right? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Mm. Therefore, he says, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. 
You always love people borrowing money from you, don't you? Isn't that awesome? In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and released him and forgave his debt. Wow. Millions of dollars and he forgave the debt. Wow. But when the man left the king, he went to his fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. Not a nice guy. His servant, fellow servant fell down before him and begged him for a little more time. We've seen this before. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king, told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you unless you refuse to forgive, if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Wow, isn't that an interesting story? You know, it's interesting that Jesus tells this story in response to Peter's question about forgiveness. How many times do I need to forgive someone? How many times do I have to forgive? And we all have, I'll bet you, we all have forgiveness questions. You know, I bet we all do. I mean, I don't, I, I'm not really expected to forgive everything, right, Jesus? Right? I mean, I don't have to forgive the jerk who doesn't even apologize, right? I mean, I understand if people say they're sorry, but what about the jerks who don't even apologize? I don't have to forgive them. Certainly there's a limit to the number of times, right, Jesus? I mean, otherwise, I'd become a doormat. We all have questions about forgiveness. And in response to the questions, Jesus tells this story, this story about this man who was forgiven this huge debt and turned around and refused to forgive a small debt. He was forgiven much, but refused to forgive even a little. Now, Jesus tells these stories. He's not telling these as historical stories, right? These are parables. These represent something. So who is the guy in the story who was forgiven this massive debt? Who was that? Who does that represent? Yeah, you know who it is? It's me. It's me. I am the guy that was forgiven the huge debt. I mean, it's you too. It's us. It's us. We have been forgiven this enormous debt. And the master in the story is God. I mean, think about this. All the things that we have done to alienate ourselves from a holy God. Think about it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not the only one in this boat, you guys. All of us. We've done things, thought things, said things to alienate ourselves from God. And God has forgiven us to bring us into this beautiful powerful, wonderful relationship with himself. It's incredible what God has set aside for me to bring me into this relationship. So you look at the guy in the story who was forgiven this huge debt. Wow, new life, freedom. Can you imagine? Can you imagine owing millions and millions of dollars and having someone wipe it out, wipe out the debt? Wow, you would expect that guy to go out and just be renewed, right? Pass it forward, right? Does he do that? No, no. The guy in the story does not believe in the power of forgiveness. Not even his own, not even his own. And it doesn't shape him. It doesn't form him. It doesn't change anything about him. You know, I mean, think about that. If, if he believed in the power of forgiveness, he would wrestle with what just happened to him. What this means for the way that he treats other people. But he doesn't do that at all. He may think it's cool, that the boss forgave him, but he doesn't believe in the power of forgiveness. And so it does nothing to him. His beliefs do not shape his actions. He lets his life shape his beliefs. He doesn't ask the so what question. He doesn't ask it. And so when you look at that story, what, what is Jesus wanting us to wrestle with, with that? He's wanting us to wrestle with, with the question, what do you think about your forgiveness? You know, Peter, Peter comes and he says, he says, how many times do I have to forgive someone? Like there's a quota, right? Like there's a limit to it. 
And Jesus says, forget that. What do you think, Peter, about your forgiveness? What do you believe about your forgiveness, about what God has set aside so that you could be a part of his holy presence? What do you believe about that, Peter? Because I'll tell you what, for me, I mean, it's been a lot. God has set aside a lot. He is overlooking a lot to let me into his presence. So what happens if I hold a grudge against someone else? What do I believe about forgiveness if I refuse to forgive someone else? Again, I may think it's awesome. I may think it's awesome that God has wiped my slate clean, that he's given me a new chance, he's given me a new life. I may think that's great. What do I believe about forgiveness? And how does it affect my life? Do my beliefs transform me? Or do I let other people's anger transform my beliefs? Do you get that? Does my faith affect my life? Or is my life affecting my faith? I mean, do you guys see why it's so important to ask the so what question? Do you see why it's important to ask that? I mean, if, if, if we're not asking so what, if we're not asking why the Bible matters to our lives, if we're not asking why our beliefs are important to us and how they're shaping us into who God wants us to be, if we're not asking that, then we really have to wonder how important our beliefs are. If they're not forming us, how important are they? Do you guys know what, you know what the difference is between believing something and thinking something? A belief and a think? <laughs> a belief is ingrained in us. A belief transforms us. A belief becomes an action. A think doesn't. You know, the guy in the story who was forgiven that huge debt, he had a think about forgiveness. He thought it was awesome. He thought it was beneficial that his boss forgave him. What did he believe about forgiveness? Nothing. He believed it was for him, but not for anybody else. And that belief is not going to transform his life. You know what, guys? Our beliefs don't transform our lives unless we put them into action, unless we become doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Every one of us, I mean, at some point, every one of us has got to ask ourselves, how strong is my faith? How solid, how central is my faith? If my faith is a house, am I built on solid ground? Am I built on solid ground? Can my house, can my faith withstand the storms that are coming against me in life? Or at some point, is my house gonna get blown over by the storms? Huh? How strong is my faith? How sturdy is it? How sturdy is it? Am I built on something that is solid or are the storms going to push me over? Now, I don't want this to sound overly simplistic, but if you find that your faith is being formed by life instead of your faith shaping your life, if you find that it's, the, that it's rickety, the answer to that lies in, in examining how important your beliefs are and why they matter to you, why they matter and how they're going to shape you. It starts with that. You know, start with the story that we heard today. Start with this story that we heard today about forgiveness. Who are you going to actively forgive this week? Whose debt will you wipe out because your debt has been wiped out? Who owes you but will owe you no more at the end of this day? Maybe, uh, maybe it's an ex-spouse. Maybe it's your current spouse. Maybe it's some kid at school whose name you don't even know. Maybe it's from years ago. Maybe it's, maybe it's from yesterday. But we are called to forgive as we have been forgiven. And Jesus wants to know what you believe about that. What do you believe about your forgiveness? And how will it make a difference in the way you live? I have been forgiven. So what? My debt has been canceled. Therefore, what? I 
hope that every one of us takes a little time and just wrestles with this question. Is your faith shaping your life or are events in life shaping your faith? If it's the second one, what are we going to do about it? I'm going to invite you to pray with me as our ushers come forward this morning to collect our offering. Father God, we seek to be formed by you, by your love for us, by your grace, by your forgiveness, by your word. Lead us, Father, to be active today in applying our beliefs to our lives. We don't want them, our beliefs sitting on a shelf. We want them forming us. And so as we give our gifts today, as we give our offerings and our tithes today, help us to release our dependence on things to be strong and secure in you. In the name of our faith founder, we pray, Jesus the Lord. Amen.